Yoga podcast. My name is Wendy Hummel. Today I speak with Dr. Renee Thornton. She's an organizational and crisis intervention psychologist, author, entrepreneur, military veteran, mother, and founder of Pathfinder Resilience. You could say I've been fangirling Dr. Thornton for the past few years. I first became familiar with her work through another former podcast guest, Roger Ruge, with whom Dr. Thornton co wrote two books Navigating Adversity, Tactical Self Care for First Responders and keeping it all together, building resilience at home while serving the community. She is passionate about building high-performing cultures within the first responder professions, whether it be with her Navigating Adversity program, a self-paced, one-of-a-kind wellness program with a whole-person approach that's geared towards public safety professionals, or her newest endeavor that focuses on leaders. Dr. Thornton is the epitome of resilience herself. She shares her personal adversity while growing up and experiencing homelessness and how her experience in the military taught her about leadership. She shares a story about one of her mentors in the military who took a chance on her despite her reputation as a troublemaker. He took notice of her writing talent after he read something she wrote about losing one of her friends in a service-related accident and sent her to journalism school. She attributes her time in the military with providing her the skills necessary for her entrepreneurial journey. Her no-nonsense, direct approach, and expertise in having difficult conversations were the backbone of her first business in the private sector. Eventually, she transitioned to working with first responders after one of her previous shipmates who transitioned to law enforcement died by suicide. She got curious about what led her friend to take his own life. She wanted answers and conducted her own psychological autopsy, which is a research tool that involves gathering information about a deceased person to help understand the circumstances of their death. The goal is to to provide insights into risk factors associated with suicide so that preventative strategies can be developed to prevent and to intervene. What she found was the impotence for her Navigating Adversity program. She determined that her friend hadn't been taught the necessary life skills to cope with adversity. In the military, he was told what to do in every aspect of his life. When he transitioned to civilian life, he didn't know how to regulate his emotions, care for his physical health, or how to set goals. All of these things were incorporated into the program that she developed as part of what she calls building wellness capital focusing more on what's right rather than what's wrong and better preparing individuals to deal with tough stuff when it comes up. Dr. Thornton is focused on building high-performing cultures and has launched a new initiative geared towards forward-thinking agency leaders, which she discusses in our conversation. She gives us a little bit of information about the playbook that she's developed and an upcoming retreat and summit for this initiative, which you can learn more about on her website, The link is included in the show notes. And finally, we talk about a topic that's near and dear to my heart lately, women, specifically discussing women at work operating within the organizational culture. Dr. Thornton is writing another book that highlights women's unique skills and role as agency influencers. She's noticed in her work that women are typically the ones speaking out about self-care, She believes that women have referential influence within organizations that drive key performance indicators and change within organizations. Her book is a celebration of what women are naturally good at and also what women need to work on, how to best deal with confrontation, boundary setting, and how to have difficult conversations. Something she says all women could use use some coaching around. I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the show, Dr. Renee Thornton. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And please, you only have to call me Dr. Thornton if I don't like you. So please call me Renee. Okay, great. That sounds good to me. So for um, for the listeners, um, I'm just going to do a quick intro um, again, even though I've done a longer one uh, preceding this. But uh, you are so many things. Um, I'm, and I'm so fortunate I've gotten to, to know you over the, the last six months or so. So obviously, first and foremost, you're um, a mother, 
um, which is probably, I would say, in talking to you, probably one of your most um, proud accomplishments. Um, you're also an organizational and crisis intervention psychologist. You're a journalist. You served time in the military. You're an author. You're an entrepreneur. Um, just doing such amazing work, and specifically for the first re responder population, from from what I can tell in in looking at what your work is. You're also um, the founder of uh, the Pathfinder Resilience. I know you've had other companies and other entrepreneurial endeavors. So um, just all things amazing, and I'm so glad to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I promise I'm not as pompous as I sound. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I can tell. Um, nobody can see us, right? Because it's just an audio show. But I love it when people can just show up. This is a Saturday morning for those of you who um, want to get a little bit of background here. Saturday morning, we're drinking our coffee. No makeup, just in our pajamas. At least I am. I don't know if she is. but um, so, so this is a great conversation, right? It's just like two girls hanging out. It is. It's coffee hour. With two fabulous ladies. That's it, really all it is. That, that, that's right. That's right. So um, I'd like to start out here. So this is actually the second time we've gotten together to record. We've talked several other times before. Um, first of all, we had a little bit of technical difficulties, but really more so um, we wanted to, to kind of reframe a little bit of what our conversation was. So just to start out, so people who may not be familiar with you, could you give a little bit of background on who you are and kind of your earlier years and what shaped the trajectory of, of where you decided to go? Because I think it's pretty significant. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess um, the thing that shaped me first and foremost is my faith. If I wouldn't have had that very concrete uh, connection to God very, very young, I probably would be dead. I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I would have died mm. when I was very, very young, either at the hands of someone else or myself. And, um, you know, I think the other thing is, you know, I was homeless when I was 14 and sleeping under a bridge and kind of created my own direction out of necessity, but also out of an absolute refusal to quit. So I talked myself into a job, talked myself into a place to sleep. Um, you know, so I just, I kind of learned really young to have respect for my own skill set. And that was essentially based on this notion that I refused to conform to anyone's expectation of me. So I was not going to follow any natural or, or traditional trajectory in life. Was not interested in like the whole get married, have children, you know, barefoot pregnant in the kitchen mentality that I was raised in. And I knew that God had bigger plans for me. I just had no clue what they were. And unfortunately it took me a lot of years of self-discovery and trial and error to get to a place where I feel really confident in who I am, what I know and what I can do for people. And that really started with starting my own business. I did that for the first time when I was 15. I've started three or four since then. And having served in the military, you know, I, I, uh, it was interesting because I got to see what real leadership looked like. And I was placed into some, to some incredibly difficult situations, ethically questionable situations. And I got to see, you know, real leaders stand up for what was right. And I think that that shaped my perspective of true leadership and the power of true leadership in a way that nothing else could. They could have chosen the easy path. They could have chosen the politically correct path, but they didn't. And I learned a lifelong lesson, and I began to emulate myself after them. So when I was a civilian again and I started my own business, the reason that my business took off was because I had a reputation for telling people what no one else had the courage to say to them. And so... I would sit across the you know, desk from an executive who has billions of dollars at his disposal, and he's asking me questions about his employees. Well, why can't I get them to do this? And why can't I get them to do that? And I would say, well, you're the reason. And everybody else thought I was absolutely insane, but the truth is the truth. And if you don't try to butter it up and make it look cute, then you can actually make progress. And so... That's what I do to this very day. I sit across from leaders every day who say, how do I overcome this recruiting problem? How do I keep the people who are really high quality? And sometimes they don't like the answer that they have to get rid of the people who are sucking the life out of everyone else. You know, regardless of how much you like them, sometimes you have to cut dead weight. So I have really difficult conversations all the time with people who lead for a living. And they lead life and death situations. And 
that's where I'm at today. Thank you for that. And there's so many different directions we can go, but I do just want to go back to your time in the military okay. uh, because we probably need hours to go through everything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, your time in the military, because the last time we spoke, you said that you had a very um, impactful, uh, I don't remember the rank, but somebody who um, noticed something in you, um, which kind of led you to really um, to go down the journalism path and writing. And so if you could speak to maybe that experience and how that that helped you, uh, especially after getting out of the military. Sure. So I joined uh, the Navy as a rescue swimmer. And I had written up something after a loss. It was, a very, it was my first loss of a shipmate who went off the back of a ship. And it was difficult for me because I knew him and I really liked him. He was just the cutest little fella. And, I, you know, he's like one of those you just want to, squeeze his cheeks kind of guys, and uh, quiet, you know, very reserved to himself, a little bit of an isolationist. And no one really knew if he went off on purpose or accidentally, but in, deep down in my heart, I think he probably did it on purpose. And that was just a really hard thing for me to process um, because, you know, I've been through a lot of really difficult things in life, and I, I couldn't see myself dying. Like, I just couldn't see myself deciding that that was the, my ultimate decision. Um, so I wrote about it, and I had a um, command master sergeant who read it. I don't even know how he got it. He wasn't in my chain of command. Well, he sent it up to the commanding officer, and I got called to the CO's office. I was petrified. <laughs> petrified. I bet. <laughs> and I had been in trouble before. Not really in trouble, but kind of in trouble because I'm a big mouth. And so when I see things that are wrong, I'm going to tell about them. So. I saw mm-hmm. some behavior um, before that with some direct chain of command members taking advantage of the younger ones and doing things they're not supposed to be doing. And so I reported them. And so I had, I have some experience with having to, to <laughs> go to the CO's office um, and it's scary. So anyways, mm-hmm. when I was there, he pulled this piece of paper out and he said, I understand that you wrote this and, I was just, you know, you don't make eye contact. I'm staring at the wall above his head, Surya, sir. And he said, do you have any desire to attend journalism school? And I looked straight at him, which was totally inappropriate. You're not supposed to look him in the eye without their permission and certainly not at attention. <laughs> and I'm going, huh? <laughs> um, what? That's not what I expected. <laughs> school, where did that even come from? And as it turns out, he Loved what I wrote. They were looking for something a little bit different than the military had traditionally done. And so I uh, went to journalism school, and I was assigned to special units. So I spent the majority of my time in the Navy with explosive ordnance division teams reporting on and writing about what they were doing. So, yeah. That is so amazing that, that he noticed something in you and, and supported you and encouraged you to, to go down that road. Um, so after you got out of the military, how did that journalism and writing time, what did that, how did that help you or, or did that lead you down kind of your next endeavor after you left the military? It didn't really lead me into my next endeavor. You know, when I was in journalism school, I had a gunnery sergeant, Cordero, who was fabulous and just the man could write. I mean amazing and uh you know he was probably the only person in my entire career whether it be in the military or even in all the years i was in school who sat me down and said you have a gift and there's something about the way that you communicate that reaches people from all walks of life and whatever you do you need to make sure that you integrate this gift into it and i've never forgotten that i always felt that was pretty phenomenal Um, And I've never forgotten the fact that my CO sent me to journalism school because, you know what, I was known as a troublemaker. I was reporting military sexual trauma, which was not a good thing to be talking about back then, let alone defending yourself for reporting on it. And this guy, he had a choice. You know, he could have sent me home. He could have been like, she's a troublemaker. She's going to cause problems. Like, I'm going to send her home. He chose not to do that. So these leaders, they took the harder path which ultimately turned into something really powerful, which I think was the bigger lesson for me. So when I got out of the military, I hated working in the civilian world. I hated it. I I became a news director really quickly 
and I found really fast that I could not stand the civilian media and the sales mentality when it came to, you know, well, we're only going to put certain things on the air because these things could affect our sales numbers. You know, our clients might not like to hear this truth. And I thought that was so ridiculous and lacked essential backbone. And in my opinion, you know, our military community, they are driven by a core set of values that are unshakable and they are not comfortable mm -hmm. in environments where those values are, are disrespected in any way. So I very quickly left the civilian workforce and I knew I had to start my own business. Well, about the same time I was volunteering in a program helping young people try to avoid going to juvenile detention. So instead of sending them to juvie, they would be assigned to me and I would try to figure out a way to help them recuperate, you know, whatever the situation was, family, school, it didn't matter. One of my students, his father was a very powerful businessman in the community, and I had to have a very frank conversation with him. And he's the executive I sat across from, and he said, you know, so what's going on with my son? And I said, you are. He was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, you want to know what the problem with your son is? You want to know how to keep him out of prison? Then you're going to have to stop working all these hours, and you're going to have to start paying attention to your child. And he was so stunned to have someone sit across from him who said that to him, but I pointed out the fact, you know, it wasn't, this wasn't an emotional conversation. I'm not an emotional person. I'm very rational. So I just laid it out for him very rationally. And I said, you know, he's done this, 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 and this, and every single thing he's done has been to get your attention and your reaction has been to work more hours. So he's only escalating his behavior based on what he wants from you. So if you want him to grow up to be a man, then you have to be one first. So that conversation. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That turned into so how did else. he respond when you said that? He actually sat back in his chair, lit a cigarette, let out a big puff, you know, because this is 20 years ago. He's still, you still smoke sure. in the buildings, right? And uh, he was quiet for a really long time. And then he said to me, can you do that same thing with my staff? And I was like, I'm sorry? Well, <laughs> yeah. So before Undercover Boss became a thing, I became an undercover member of businesses and I was getting hired to go into these companies as secretary, as, you know, a, a file clerk, as a go girl, you know, I, I even cleaned bathrooms just so I could listen and watch without anyone suspecting me for anything whatsoever. And then my job is to go to the CEO and tell them exactly what was going on. I became very, very good wow. at finding people who were stealing from their bosses, people who were breaking the rules. I mean, like all kinds of stuff. So I became a little their little police force, but it ultimately became a culture, you know, a specialty, a specialization in organizational cultures and how to lead really strong, solid, high-performing cultures, which is what we're doing today. Wow. How interesting how that one conversation, that ripple effect, how it led to, to all those other things after. So um, let's talk a little bit about, because I know there's so many things we could talk about because you've done so much amazing work. Um, some of the things that are specific to the first responder population, if you don't mind talking a little bit about your your business, Pathfinder Resilience, a few of the books that you wrote, um, because really the way that I came to know of you was through a previous podcast guest of mine, Roger Ruge, and who I just think is is such an amazing human being, as I know you do too. Um, and so I know that you co-wrote a book and that he still has something to do with, with Pathfinder Resilient. So if you could speak to that a little bit, and then maybe we can we'll talk a little bit more about some of the other things you do after that. Well, sure. So about 2010, uh, I took a left turn out of corporate America because a, mm -hmm. one of my shipmates who had transitioned into uh, public safety when he got out of the military committed suicide. And it just totally shook me out of left field, didn't see it coming. We had a really solid core group of, of shipmates who got together with regularity and not one of us had enough information, but when we put it all together, we could see that it was coming. He was really smart. He only told each of us like a little bit. So it wasn't until after his passing that we connected all the dots. And um, so we, I decided that day I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing corporate work anymore. I am going to shift my focus to understanding what happened. And because he's, he was literally the, one of the toughest people you would ever meet. Mental toughness, I mean, he was, a, he was from a special team. So it's not like he was 
he was weak in any way. And we'd seen a lot of stuff, and I knew that he saw way more than I did. And so I, my assumption was that it was trauma-related, you know, okay, so it was something that had happened to him when he was in the military, and he carried that trauma forward, PTSD, something, something. No, it turned out it wasn't. I, I conducted a psychological autopsy is what it's called today, right? But back then, it was just me being a journalist. I was, I was being curious, and so I, I walked his life. And in the course of all that walking, I discovered something that just totally shook my world. I mean, I had sticky notes all over my office with all these thoughts I had and ideas and the truth about where he'd been and what his days were like. And I'm sitting there staring at them one day, and I went, the man literally did not know how to live life on life's terms. No one had ever taught him self-care, like how to take care of himself without somebody telling him, uniform of the day is this. You report to this duty station at this on this day at this time. You do this at this time. And, you know, it's really hard. That assimilation process can be incredibly difficult for people because you do go from a command-centric mentality into all this freedom. You know, the first time that we shop for clothes as a civilian was so difficult because you're, you're used to just having, you know, three uniforms hanging in your closet, and every day you pick one out based on what someone else tells you the uniform of the day is. So – his closet struck me. He had two pair of jeans and three T-shirts in it. That was it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So I just understood fundamentally in that moment that it wasn't a military issue. It wasn't a PTSD issue. It wasn't a trauma issue. It was, li it was a life issue. This guy had never been taught life skills. And I'm like, I haven't really been taught those things either. I mean, when do we ever really get taught anything about how to regulate our own emotional reactions to stuff. In the military, mm -hmm. we're taught how to use breath work to maintain, you know, poise under pressure, but there's so much more to it than that. When were we ever sure. taught that we're getting headaches because we don't have enough of the right kinds of sodium in our body when we're drinking water? When were we ever taught about true goal setting, like the kind that actually ensures that you're going to reach some sort of pivotal success in your life. Like, these are things that we actually need to drive ourselves forward. And as I'm thinking this stuff, I'm realizing, holy smokes, the reason I have been successful is because I was kicked out on my butt when I was 14, and I had no choice but to learn how to take care of myself. So I had that going for me in a way that no one else did, which ultimately turned into something that started out as the Heroes Project which was a self-care training program that took therapeutic tools and holistic tools and business tools and psychological techniques and threw them into a training program because we're all comfortable with training and we hate therapy. And then I went on the hunt for, you know, someone, a uh, department to, that would be willing to be guinea pigs in a research study to test this. To see if this thought that I had, this crazy, insane idea did any good for anybody. And I found um, Chief Ron Teachman out of the South Bend Police Department. He's the, he was the chief at the time. Um, and he was like, this is kind of brilliant. I like it. So he let me into the police department. His colleague let me into the fire department. And that right there established the first research study that measured the effectiveness of self-care on a lot of these different outcomes, mental health outcomes, but performance outcomes, individual outcomes, you know, so that was the birth of what is now known as navigating adversity and the self-care model that takes into account all eight dimensions of what it means to be a happy, healthy, thriving human being. That's where Roger comes in. You know, Roger is a, one of my instructors in that course. He's one of the mentors, and he is the co-author of that book. And then the one that followed, Keeping It All Together, which we wrote specifically for family members and loved ones of the first responder community so that they could go through this learning experience together and further enhance this notion of something much larger than the self, frankly. It's the profession's driving force. You know, that family, that close-knit community, that passion, that patriotism, all that stuff, that's all a professional arc. That's a culture in the United States. It's something we take seriously. It's something that drives us from our souls. And 
we've made so many mistakes in the way that we choose people to, to serve in this profession, to the way that we train them in this profession. And that's what we do now. Today, our company focuses on building high-performing cultures. So entire cities that are high-performing, that are driven by individual team, unit, department, city success. And then we teach them what that looks like and how, how to do it. So people are finally given the tools that they need. They go way beyond wellness, way beyond mental health care. They're, they're actually learning how to set themselves up for success, how to be great parents, how to be great spouses, how to be amazing firefighters, how to be the best law enforcement officer, how to rise above what other people think you should be doing in an ethically challenging situation and do the right thing because that's who you are at your core. So all of that stuff is impossible without forward thinking, truly pioneering leaders, which as it turns out, is they're, they're kind of hard to find. Well, thank you for all of that. So much to unpack, but let me just hit, let me just hit what you said towards the end. Um, your, your program, um, that you still offer to agencies. Is that something that's delivered online? I think I know the answer or in person. How does it look? So if somebody's listening right now and they're like, man, we really need to bring that training to our agency, because quite frankly, there's a lot of different training that's out there, especially in the last couple of years. Um, and I've vetted a lot. I don't know all of it in the position I'm in, but why why, first of all, why is this one um, something that an agency should consider? And if they do, what does it look like to bring it there? Is It's online, I assume. Is there somebody that, that is kind of facilitating when people are doing this? Kind of just explain, if you don't mind, what it would look like to do that. Sure. So Navigating Adversity is actually available via an app. So anyone can access it from anywhere they are. That's really important. And all the aspects of the training experience are in short chunks, 15 minutes or less. So you can learn, listen, um, you know, do all this stuff on the go, no matter where you're at in the gym. So it's also available online. If someone would prefer to learn at their laptop or at their PC, that's totally fine too. But we just find that a lot of people really prefer to have it with them on their phone. So it's on the app. And the reason that it's, well, there are a lot of reasons that it's better than anything out there, um, primarily because it was built to be better than anything out there. It, it's built to overcome the objections that people in uniform have to helping themselves. Primarily, anonymity. Like, there's just, there's so much power in the fact that I don't give a rip who you are. You can sign up as Tom Cruise, and I would not know the difference. That's a beautiful protection. Right. The other thing is, we teach people how to recognize symptoms that they're experiencing for what they really are. And that is another true issue inside of public safety. We reach for an alcohol, you know, a bottle of alcohol at the end of the day because we're trying to numb the symptoms from the day, and because that's what we're told to do. Oh, you feeling a little jittery tonight? Just go home and have a shot. Go get a beer. You'll be fine. So instead of that as a solution, asking, you know, teaching people, hey, if you're experiencing this, then this is something that you can actually do about it. You know, the other reason is organizationally, the stigma that controls mental health and wellness in this community has to be broken. And the only way to do that, in my experience and in my, and I would say expert opinion, because I've spent so many years building this and refining it and correcting it with the feedback of the first responder community, by the way, the only way to eliminate that stigma is to replace the common language around it with something positive. So in navigating adversity, while we introduce the idea that, yeah, if you're experiencing this symptom, you could be dealing with anxiety, you could be dealing with depression. That's such a minimal bit of our focus, what we're actually saying is, okay, well, if you're experiencing this, then what you want to be doing is using this tool, this tool, and this tool so that you can build something called wellness capital. So the more capital you actually have built up in your life, then when something bad happens, something unexpected comes along, you're so not phased by it because you're not depleted when it happens. So we're literally saying the research, and we research everything, because I don't believe that it's fair to sell a training program to anybody anywhere, especially our public service community, without being able to show whether or not it's effective to very specific outcomes. So we research everything. And what we're seeing are a number of different outcomes. We're seeing that 
people who come into the program with higher levels of depression, anxiety, stress, organizational stress, um, even tendencies towards substance abuse, leave with such low numbers as they wouldn't even be diagnosable. Like they may have been diagnosable before, but they're not anymore. And people's conversations around the water cooler at work have shifted. And now they're actually going up to each other and asking each other, hey, how's your social capital? Because we have an activity this week and I think you should come and join us so you can meet this person and this person and build your network. So the conversation shifts from something very negative, that whole mental health, mental distress, mental disease mentality, to something incredibly positive, building wellness capital, focusing on building psychological capital and you know, physical capital. Like you're doing something to help change yourself. The other thing that's really amazing is agencies that have implemented this agency-wide and provided the program to their loved ones, uh, which is usually a bonus that we just throw in. Agencies that provide this to their entire you know, organization and then offer the loved ones version as well. We usually just bonus that in because we want the loved ones to have this experience. We don't really care. We're not here to make money. It doesn't matter. Um, but what they're seeing is people who indicated that they were planning on changing their jobs in the next six months, after going through the Navigating Adversity training course, 78% of them have said, I'm staying because now I'm not a number. And I know my agency cares about me. Plus, I feel like I'm more in control of my outcomes. So there are a lot of things that we're measuring, and ultimately the impact to the organization has been pretty tremendous. And it saves them money because they don't really have to build out like a, a traditional wellness unit for a lot of these agencies that are really small. They don't have the money to do that. This is a great alternative to it. Well, thank you for that explanation. And I, you know, you and I talked a little bit before we started recording and to use your term, um, you called it trauma fatigue, just really um, this overemphasis of talking about all the negative and all. And, and I think it's important that we do talk about it, but, but I have noticed as well over the last several years since, you know, being in the position that I'm in that people already understand that we don't need to be a dead horse. They already get that part of it. Um, but they, you know, wanting to focus on, I don't know if they want to focus on it, but I think the need is once they're exposed to it, understanding, um, really having to, to focus on these tools, these skills, on the positive, on positive psychology tools, which is something that we're trying to implement at our agency. So I really appreciate your program. And I, I haven't been through the program, but I've read both of the books that, that you co-wrote with, with Roger. And in fact, I think you know this, but for the listeners, I was so impressed with the book um, and Roger explained a lot more to me in person about the program that we um, are, we hosted our first family conference at our wellness for our wellness unit. And Roger came as a guest speaker and we gave everyone who attended a book. And if they were a first responder, they got the original version. And if they were a family member, they got the, the family version. So, so I appreciate your work and thank you very much for, for kind of breaking that down and explaining why it's so beneficial, and also the research. I'm big on that. I couldn't agree more. Um, you you have to have something that's proven to work, the before and after. People want to know that. They deserve to. You know, we have so much scrutiny now in our cities for how we're spending our money and why we're hiring these people and what are we doing with this budget item. And, you know, our, our city leadership, they are executives. Unfortunately, they are not provided – the same level of education that a traditional executive is. And so a lot of them are learning on the fly and many of them are learning what their predecessor did, which is frequently a mistake because you're not dealing with the same anything, the same society, the same you know, applicant pool. <laughs> like nothing is the same today as it was maybe 20 years ago when the predecessor started being the chief or the city manager or whatever. So yeah, it's important that we think as executives and that we respect the executive role so that the decisions that are being made in our cities as citizens, we should be making sure that the decisions that are being made in our cities are evidence-based and that they're doing their very best to invest our taxpayer dollars instead of spend them on things that just seem like the flavor of the month, which I completely understand the mentality there because there are a lot of people out there who are big names and they're famous and they're funny and they're motivational. And so you want to pay them to come in and, 
and entertain people and make them feel good for a minute, but I'm looking for long-term success. I'm not really looking for ways to make people feel good, you know, today. I want them to make themselves feel good. I just want to give them the tools to do it. And I think of everybody, and I know this because I've worked with the civilian community for a long time too, if you look at it, uh, our public safety community and our veteran community, they are driven to be better to be excellent, to be awesome. And they want to get those tools so that they can do it themselves. They don't necessarily like relying on other people. And by and large, societally, we've gotten to a place where we're just like, hey, go ahead and be lazy. Don't mind, do whatever you want. But our community is different. We don't want to be lazy. We want to help ourselves. And so we have to respect that desire and give them things that are going to excite them, but that work. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. <clears throat> and I can, I'll tell you, and I've told you this, you know, before we recorded, I think a different time, but um, I really, I really appreciated, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a webinar you did. It was actually about recruiting, I think. And you broke down those psychological skills that you just referred to. And then I think you compared them to, to the wellness model that you talked about and how much overlap there is. And, and something that's really been beneficial to me um, is something that you said um, about some research that you did about how we have people come in the door and then how shortly thereafter um, things change once they're on the job. And, and there's so much more I want to get to, but if you don't mind just briefly kind of speaking to, to that point. Yeah, I call it the old recruitment bait and switch. <laughs> it's That's not right. Cool. That's what it, it was. Is, <laughs> but it's so not cool. And, you know, there are things that we're really missing the mark on, and, and this is one of them. We recruit people specifically for a set psychological skills, characteristics model, basically. We've learned that if, if you come into the profession with these psychological skills, then you actually have the ability to maintain the, the stressors of the profession, and we don't have to worry so much that you're going to end up with serious difficulty, right? Problem is we don't tell you what those psychological skills are. We hire you for them, but we never tell you what they are. We, never, we know they're perishable, but we are not offering you any training or any refreshers or anything that enhances them. And so then we're sort of scratching our heads going, it's a five-year mark, the 10-year mark. Why are people washing out? Well, we hired them to be heroes. And then the minute they got in the door, we treated them like, well, hey, heroism is just part of the job. Don't ask us to pat you on the back, which is, by the way, such a mistake. Think about it from the perspective of the youngest generation. Just for a second, I want to point this out. It's kind of interesting. I just had this conversation with a couple of directors in 911. I said, you know, everyone complains about this whole participation trophy generation. You know, they all come into the centers. They all come into the law enforcement profession, and they think they're going to get participation trophies. Well, you know what? Um, they got participation trophies as children, so you can't change the mentality that they were raised with. But what you should be doing is creating – an accolades, something that, that celebrates their successes and do it in a way that makes sense and matters to them. Don't hand them a certificate like that would have been cool to me to get something to put up on my wall. But to, to Gen Z, they don't give a rip about those things. Where are they going to even put them? They're used to the digital world. They want to be an influencer online. Put that stuff out on your social media. Celebrate people online so that their world can see it because that stuff lights a fire. I mean, stop trying to push against and fight who our younger generations are. Instead, embrace them for who they are and start thinking outside the box. So don't recruit them and then put them down when they want to be celebrated for doing something that's amazing. Let's not forget what amazing looks like and why this, this is a unique organization. You know, this is a unique profession. This is a unique career. The minute we stop recognizing that, we lose the passion and the fire that we, we're literally recruiting for. Why are we putting it out? So we're killing our own like public safety profession one person at a time. It's, it's awful. So how do you, in a nutshell, because I this probably isn't a, a short answer, but besides um, your program, besides the, the Navigating Adversity Tactical Resilience Program, what else do you suggest that, that leaders or agencies do to ensure that that doesn't happen? What do you suggest? And I know that's that's a lot to what you're saying about the work you do in, in culture and leadership, but if you could maybe break that down to us, maybe some of the things you tell, advise people to do. Well, Wendy, that's going to be a really long conversation. 
<laughs> okay, well, just give me yeah, a couple sorry. of tidbits, and maybe we can have another, 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 another well, conversation. The reason that I mean that's such a great question, and it's one of the things that kind of took me right back to culture and focusing on leading high performance cultures. So um, I'm at, I'm building something. It's called, and I have been for a few years. It's called the High Performing Culture Playbook. It's essentially an A to Z playbook that walks people through how do you. It actually walks the leader through how do you reverse engineer your leadership DNA to create an organizational culture that's a reflection of who you are inside of this bigger profession. And one of the things that, um, you know, we talk about is this notion of values. And I don't mean values like, so inside of Navigating Adversity, we have a values assignment, and it, it basically requires that people consider what are their top five unbudgeable values? This is on a whole nother level because you have to consider the changing landscape of society when you're talking about what you value. Think about law enforcement for, for just a moment. How incredibly difficult the learned hopelessness cycle is for a law enforcement officer who arrests someone who is turned out the next morning by a judge who does not understand the implications of letting this criminal back out on the street. Then you have to rearrest him three or four days later for even worse crime. Then he goes back out on the streets again. And then here he is again. You know, we had a situation, I don't even remember the details of it, but the guy was, he, he killed a police officer last week in New York City and he had, what, 21 different run-ins with the law. And at no point did anyone stop and say, hey, hang on a minute, this guy is a dangerous person. Why is he out running the street? As a cop, I cannot imagine how gut-wrenching it must feel to know that you have to look a victim in the eye and you cannot promise that person justice. That is a sense of learned helplessness that goes straight to the core value system of this profession. So the very first thing a leader who really wants to build a high-performing culture has to do is to acknowledge that there are things that are not within his control or her control. And sure. they have to talk about how do those things truly affect my people and then start making that a part of the fabric of your culture. Because yes, you're going to arrest someone. And yes, unfortunately, once you arrest them and you process them, it's a different group of people who get to decide what happens. So how do you help your people deal with the fallout of that? We've been ignoring that, and strong leaders address it, and they say, okay, I know these are things that you value. These are things that we value. How can we come together and make sure that that value system does not get derailed by someone outside of our, our culture? Now, that is where you figure out how to connect the profession's culture or profession's value with the chief's value, with every person's value who lives and works and serves in that city. And you have to protect those values. Then you're gonna keep your people because when someone experiences something like, hey, I just had to rearrest that guy and he just sexually assaulted this woman who lives down the street from me or who's you know, my daughter's friend at school or some, some ridiculous thing that never should have happened in the first place, inside a high-performing organization, they take a minute and they acknowledge that. And they say, man, I can't even believe what, what we have to go through. And I'm sorry that you experienced that. You're not alone in this. I 100% agree with your frustration. And I'm not going to let politics drive my response to this because right is right and wrong is wrong. And we've gotten away from that black and white mentality a lot of times by training people to live in the gray area, but the gray area is tearing us apart. And so we just have to come back, you know, to a place that that center that, that brings us all and unites us all behind common value systems, and common goals. And we have to remember that we're humans and for, for God's sake, that stuff is hard. So pat someone on the back, let them know, Hey, I know what today was for you. And that that's really tough. If you need something, let me know. There's more power in that statement and that action than you realize. So that goes right you made into me your, think about a lot of yeah, things. your recruitment, your retention, yeah. your, you know, it's like literally, that's what I mean about a high performing organization. 
it's a machine and it is it's complex and it's amazing and it requires dedicated solid leadership that will not back down under pressure and mm-hmm. that's uh that's a really hard thing to come by really really hard thing to come by yeah because it's complicated and it really requires a lot of resources time like you said you have to reverse engineer the process and really be dedicated to to making it work because it does require resources. Um, so real quick, I want to just ask you this playbook that you're referring to, is this going to be something that will be available through consulting? Are you writing or authoring something? Um, do you not know? Are you ready to talk about that? <laughs> oh, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's okay, an actual okay. book. Um, it will not be made available okay. to the public. Um, I am, I have launched the first annual in a Pathfinder International Summit on Leading High Performance Cultures. It will be hosted this October on Mackinac Island in Michigan. And it is going to be two things, really. It is a retreat for executive level leadership inside of public safety organizations, but it's also a very powerful summit wherein everyone who comes will receive the playbook and we are going to build a strategy for organizational change that will take a number of years to execute because culture change is not a quick thing. So what we're going to be doing even before that is something called, and this comes out of Lean Six Sigma mentality, it's something called the current state assessment. So I'm going to be conducting research inside of every one of those organizations to get a very clear, quantified uh, perspective of what the employees are looking for, what they're currently experiencing, where they are right now. You know, just honestly, what are they really struggling with? So that everyone who comes to the summit on the very first day will get their current state report. And that report gives you real-time information about what your current staffing challenges are, but also where your people need you to take them. And then you integrate that into your strategic plan while you're at the summit. And then when they leave, this cohort, by the way, they're only, I'm maxing out the invitations at 20. I'm not going to let anybody, you know, no more than 20 um, executives will come, and everyone has to be invited. So I'm conducting interviews with people who are interested in, in attending, and I'm selecting the, the people based on, basically based on humility and temperament and their true dedication to this process. Because this initial cohort will continue to meet every single month, See, right there is where that connection piece is so important because then they have each other's support no matter what they face when they're going through this challenge. So they have, you know, 19 other executives to reach out to and say, okay, I'm really struggling with this, and I heard you say that you've handled this before. What worked for you? Or I just need somebody to listen to me right now. And you can't talk to somebody in your organization when you're struggling. You really need another, like, sort of that same level of leadership who doesn't have an effect on your career trajectory to trust. So this cohort is really, really important. And uh, they'll go through this journey together. And then next year, they'll be invited back to provide some research evaluations and reporting to the next cohort. And then they'll sort of take on a leadership role with them and start mentoring them through the process. So the plan here, the goal, is to allow the public safety leadership to affect change inside of its own profession like wildfire, you know, in an organic way. They learn it together, they live it together, they lead it together, and then we repeat the process. And, you know, hopefully 10 years from now we'll have 500 people who are progressively leading our cities into high-performing cultures. Well, you know what, that sounds amazing, and um, I may have to talk to you a little bit more about that when we're done recording. So if someone listening thinks they may be interested, I'll definitely make sure they know how to get a hold of you in the show notes. Um, are you looking specifically for people that are chiefs and sheriffs or, or what, when you say executive level, captains, lieutenants, is there a cutoff? Yeah, I'm only looking for um, the highest level of the organization, like your director, your manager. If you have the decision-making ability to, to like operational decision-making ability, gotcha. then yes. Sure. Um, I will hopefully, uh, my plan in the future is to actually create a separate one that's for your um, lieutenant level, captain level, 
so that they can learn some really important aspects of culture change and how to lead that effectively. But for this year, the pilot summit, or for this summit, will just be restricted to that chief sheriff level um, leadership. Okay, great. Well, thank you. That That's amazing. And I can't wait to find out more about how that, that goes. Oh, it's going to be so fun. We're already having fun. I mean, we're, I just have a core group and they're phenomenal. I love them. They were really hard to find. I would tell you. And I, I talk to chiefs all the time, but, and they're really the ones who inspired this, you know, it wasn't just a return to what I know best. It was really them saying, you know what, Renee, it's great that we have you to talk to because they do use me as a resource like that, and I, I love it. I'm, I only make myself available to those level of leaders because I recognize that their challenges are incredibly nuanced, and they don't have anyone they can talk to. But I wanted more for them than that, and they said, you know, it just would be great if I had, like, another chief I could call and just, you know, kind of lean on a little bit sometimes and ask some advice from and just to – be able to respect yet another, you know, another person who sees things the way that I see them. And so I've, I've chosen um, a group, you know, the, the first wave of invitations has gone out and I, I have chosen about 12 of the available 20 seats and I'm super excited. And honestly, I don't know that I'm going to bring all 20. I may only bring 15 or 16 or whatever. It's more important to me that the quality of the cohort is protected than focusing on the number in the room. Yeah, that's smart. And and I know what you're describing is much bigger than this, but I just recently went to the IACP Officer Safety and Wellness Conference. It was in Kentucky. And one of the big topics was executive le- level peer support. Um, just identifying the need that you need to really have the people that are up top on these organizations support one another because, you know, we've heard so much about um, peer support for, for all levels of the agency, but it kind of cuts off when you hit a certain rank. And so, yep. and again, I realize this is much more than that, but that fills that gap also so that they have this kind of contained level of support across the country. Well, and they're united by a singular vision. They're all embarking upon this mm-hmm. journey together and it takes courage to do this. You know, it takes courage to acknowledge that you need to do something to affect positive change in your organization because it's a, mild acknowledgement that maybe it's not perfect and that's okay. We don't, we don't ever actually reach perfection, but it's something that we can certainly drive ourselves towards. And at least in this regard, they'll have the playbook. They'll have a strategic plan. They'll have data sets. You know, they're, they're not going to go through this alone. And I think they're ultimately going to become some of the strongest leaders that this nation has ever seen in public safety. And frankly, you know, I'm super excited about the legacy that they're about to create for themselves. And it's across the aisle. It's not just law enforcement. It's law enforcement. It's fire. It's EMS. It's 911. And that's the way it ought to be. Even emergency um, uh, physicians at the, in the emergency room level have been applying. And I love that idea because emergency services are emergency services. We are all first responders. So I'm thrilled that it's being accepted the way that it is and that people are as excited about it as I am. I will say that we were encouraging spouses to come. There'll be some programming for them in the morning and then they can go hang out on the island. Um, and it's, it's just going to be a really great opportunity to reset and to walk away with a plan of action with all the tools and resources you need to execute, which I just think is fantastic. Yeah, this sounds amazing, and I can't I can't wait to talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, I do want, as we kind of kind of transition, we're you know we're almost at an hour, and I want to respect your time. Um, it is like as you and I are recording this, we're just about at the end of March, and which is the end of Women's History Month, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that because I know that you have done and are also doing some work specifically to to support women in, in the first responder field. And if you could talk a little bit about that, um, I know that there's another book that you've been working on and some other things. Um, if you could just speak to that as we kind of round out the end of, of Women's History Month. Sure. Um, okay. So I have just found as a researcher, I look for, for data points that kind of jump out at me when I'm looking over a number of years worth of data. And I found that women by far um, are more engaged in like the self-care process on the job than men are. I mean, maybe it's not that it's 
there's more of them doing it, but it's more, there are more of them talking about it. Guys have a tendency to kind of keep the self-care thing, the regimen to themselves. Some are really excited about it and others just do what needs to be done and, you know, they just keep it for themselves. But girls, Chatty Cathy's, they love to, oh, look what I'm doing and it's really cool and you should try it too. And I love that. It's super great because women are, um, are influencers beyond their own recognition. And I think that there are things that we need to celebrate about that. Um, because it's just, it's the way that we were uniquely created, you know? Men are excellent in answering questions under fire. Women are excellent at lighting a fire under someone else. <laughs> you know, we just didn't, you know, we just don't say things like that out loud often enough. And so I'm, I wanted to just recognize the fact that women have referential influence inside of an organization and in the, in the home even that really do drive more um, key performance indicators, more goals, like, more change than they get credit for. And I think once they realize that, then they start thinking strategically like, oh, really? So huh, I would like to see this change in the organization. How can I do that? <laughs> and that's kind of where the book that I'm working on um, comes from. It's just a celebration of the things that women are naturally good at and how we can use those things to affect positive change. And then it also addresses some of the things that we need to work on where, like I said, men are great at answering questions under fire. Well, women hate confrontation, but they need to be trained in it because in this profession, you've got to be able to defend yourself and not put up with BS. And unfortunately, there are a lot of women who send me messages and they're like, you're not going to believe what I just, you know, what I just went through. And my first question is, why did you tolerate it? Well, I don't know how to set boundaries. Oh, well, let's fix that because at the very, very, very fundamentally, you are allowed your boundaries, honey. So let's talk about how to set them. And I think sometimes you'd need someone like me who's bold and um, who likes to have fun and laugh a lot and make things easier to talk about to lead that conversation because it's a confidence builder for someone who is really struggling to hear someone in my position say, you have every right to stand up for yourself. In fact, you need to go back right now and stand up for yourself. <laughs> so, oh, okay, fine. I'm going to do that. And then they do, and then they feel amazing. And I, I wish there were more people out there who weren't, you know, so worried about the consequences. Frankly, I don't care about them. You don't have to like me. It's not about that. At the end of the day, you're, you leave the respect to work that I do because I bust my ass better than, sorry, I just said yeah. Um <laughs> Oh, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> People have said much worse than that on here. I was trying so hard, too. I'm, I'm a recovering sailor swear. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, so that's that's just some of what I, I try to do when it comes to women. It's not so much that I care about the fact that they're women versus men. It's just that there are things that God uniquely gifted us with, and I think we should celebrate them more often because it empowers us to affect change much more than we currently are. Well, I, and I appreciate you, you know, kind of explaining that because we've talked about this offline quite a bit. And this is something that, especially as I get older, um, I reflect back on that um, there's some things I wish I could have done differently or would have done differently. And having the awareness to the, to the points that you just spoke of earlier in my career and in my life, quite frankly, would have been really helpful. That has always been in me very innate to speak my mind and not put up with shit. And I'll curse too to make you feel better. Um, but I didn't always do that. And it was always at the expense of fitting in and getting along, um, in a, in a male dominated culture. And really it was to the point where, um, you know, I didn't want to associate myself with movements that involved other women. Like I always had a lot of female friends in the profession. We supported each other, but it was more of a private support. And, you know, I know that the word feminism kind of puts people off, but, it, you know, and it, it did to me too. It kind of triggered something in me because I thought it meant that I was going to be this extreme man hating. If I support women, it was either or it couldn't be both. And, and I look back at that thinking and I'm like, God, that was just so, um, so not the way that it is. And I feel very strongly that we do need to support each other outwardly and openly and, um, and so that's why I'm so interested in some of the work that you're doing when it comes to that specifically, because especially having, you know, daughters too. And, and I can tell you that what I've learned and things that have kind, kind of come up for me over the last five or six years when it comes to this is, um, 
I think probably the thing I'm most proud of is talking to my girls about this. And I can tell you at almost 18 years old, um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but um, my daughter does, she can speak up for herself and she can confront difficult situations better than most people that are adults that I know. Um, and I, that's probably something that I'm, uh, you know, the most proud of as a mom, because you talked about how do we learn these things? How do we learn these important skills? And, um, and there are things that I, I'm trying my hardest. I'm not perfect <laughs> to impart on my kids, but also to do things in the workplace to support other women specifically. I support everybody, um, that's doing this job, but it is unique. We are different. And I think it's okay that, that we talk about that and we do things specifically to, to lift each other up. I totally agree. I'll tell you what, Wendy, here's the marker for me of, of a woman of any age um, says, okay, she's really ready. Like she's really, she knows herself and she is ready. If a woman can, let's say she's in a relationship with a guy and, um, you know, he wants her to move in with him. Okay, fine. Well, then are we combining our, it's all about money right there. It's all about money. Are we combining our finances? Well, you know, you'll take care of this and I'll take care of this. Okay, so if I'm moving in with you, then what's going to happen to my house? Oh, okay, well, you're going to sell your house. Oh, okay, so I'm going to sell my house and move in with you. And then what? You know, so it's the ability to have the money conversation that protects your assets. Everything, it's got to be this way. Okay, so if we're not married, and even if we are, um, what's in it for me? Please don't be afraid to ask that question because you've got to protect yourself because without that conversation, you're going to find that like 90% of women traditionally, um, if there's a divorce or a breakup, you're out on your ear because you moved into his house and it's still his house. And, you know, maybe you guys bought a car, but it's in his name. Traditionally speaking, boomers, Gen Xers, we've been trained from almost birth that in a relationship with a man, the man handles the finances and you're, you don't put your name on things because you trust the man. And he has been trained that if a woman loves him, she will trust him blindly. And so to me, the mark of a woman who is truly ready to run her life and is ready to stand up for herself is a, is a financial planner. And she asks those questions and she does not get herself buried in a hole out of love for anyone because if a man loves you he will not allow you to put yourself in a situation where you are financially at risk should something go wrong yeah that's a really good point because that's not something we talk a lot about and i my husband and i just talked about this this morning because i wasn't taught very much about managing money in fact i wasn't wasn't really taught very well at all made some mistakes along the way and and just kind of figured some things out and my husband and I, you know, when we met, we both had student loans. We were both in the first responder profession. We figured it out, okay, on our own. And so that is something that is a high priority for me with my kids is teaching them the value of saving. Um, in fact, you know, trying to already build credit for a 17-year-old so that when she graduates college, she's got a credit score. Um teaching her that she needs to save every time she gets a paycheck, regardless of how, how small it is. These are things that no one ever taught me. I mean, when I went to college and got a credit card and ran it up and was in debt and then had to figure out how to pay it off at a high interest rate. And, and so anyhow, to your point, we could talk about that for a long time. Um, that was me. And that's something that I think is really crucial to, to talk about as well. So thanks for bringing I that up. I think it's an organizational requirement. I mean, I, for a high performing organization, mm -hmm. This needs to be something that is a conversation as a part of the fabric of the culture. And you've got to look out for each other. And you have to recognize that there are differences in the way that genders are trained and taught to think about money and money management. So it just kind of drives right back to that, like, how much care are we really showing the people we're recruiting into our organization? And it's not that we don't care about them. It's we don't know how to do it right. And so this, the whole idea of the playbook is, okay, this is how you do it right. These are the things you really have to think about. You have to plan for and delegate and and make a part of the fabric of your culture moving forward because we are not the same profession or society or culture as we were 30 years ago 
Yes. And um, I am, for one, really looking forward to all of your amazing work, your playbook. Um, if I can get a copy, I don't know if I, if I, you know, fit the criteria, but, but maybe get an eye on it and also your book about women coming up. So I appreciate the work you're doing, everything that you do for the first responder culture and, and really everyone, because I consider you a trailblazer, you know, and I, I appreciate your honesty and I love your authenticity and I think we need more of it. So thank you for everything you do. Um, and I just really appreciate your time being on the podcast. Oh, it's been an honor. You're so sweet. We'll do it again sometime. <laughs> oh, oh, definitely. This isn't the end. Anything you want to leave the listeners with that you haven't already said? Any uh, any last bit of, of wisdom that you want to impart? Honestly, I just want people to ask themselves the question. Am I living intentionally today? If you're not, fix that problem. Thank you, Dr. Renee Thornton. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Renee Thornton. If you did, I ask that you please share, like, or give us a review. And remember, we are better together. 